Hi all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. Well, thanks to each and every one of you, I've hit 600 subscribers on my channel. I know that's not much compared to other YouTubers, but it's a big deal to me. So, to celebrate, I learned how to edit my videos. A little. Don't think I didn't just hear you whisper, thank God. Because I did. But, I can't say I blame you. You've been putting up with me making mistakes because I've been doing them all in one take. And to be honest, there were times when I'd screw up toward the end of, like, the fifth try, so I'd just give up and hope you didn't notice. You guys were so very cool about it, though, and I appreciate that. But don't get excited yet. I'm not a pro or anything, so don't think I won't mess up anymore, because Lord knows I'll find a way. But hopefully my videos will get better. In this video, I thought I'd change things up a bit. Instead of doing a single true crime story, I thought I'd do a series of shorter stories that I don't necessarily have enough info on to do an entire video about, but I still want to tell them. Since I've seen so many stories come up in Metro Detroit, Michigan lately, I thought I'd take you on a crime tour through them all, as well as include an update or two from previous stories I did that have recent updates. Sound good? I hope so. Okay, before I start our crime tour, since I learned how to edit, I asked my son's uber creative friend, John Kick, to create a couple intros and outros for my videos so they won't be so boring anymore. I absolutely love what he created for my channel. And to celebrate reaching 600 subscribers, I want to show it to you. Now, because I'm excited, and I want to know what you think, he created a longer intro for longer videos and a shorter one for shorter videos. I'm going to show you the longer one now and hope you love it. If you're not one for intros, I get it, but I love it, so I want to use it on my videos. So just to make me happy, just click past it if it's not for you. I'd really appreciate that. So, off we go, on to my new intro. Cool, huh? I hope you love it as much as I do. He did a great job. Okay, on to our tour of murder and mayhem in Michigan. Not gonna lie, it's gonna be a bumpy ride. There have been a lot of horrific things happening in and around Detroit lately. Not to mention the roads here are full of potholes, so strap in and hold on tight, because I'm about to take you on a hell of a ride. Our journey starts in the city of Clinton Township, which is a suburb north of Detroit, where police say that Kevin Van Elst slit his pregnant girlfriend's throat with a box cutter as she tried to exit her vehicle to go to the police station to file a restraining order against him. According to a police report, Van Elst was threatening his pregnant girlfriend, oh, I'm sorry, ex-girlfriend, on October 9th of 2020. So, she went to police for help. The report says that she realized she was being followed but didn't know by whom. She told police he opened her car door and said, I told you I was coming for you, and slit her throat multiple times with a box cutter. She made it to the lobby of the station, where she was given first aid and transported to the hospital. In the meantime, the suspect took off in his truck and fled the state. The victim, who is pregnant with the suspect's child, received numerous stitches for her wounded neck and she's currently recovering in the hospital. Almost one week after the attack, police and U.S. Marshals were alerted that the suspect's truck was spotted at a homeless shelter in Charleston, West Virginia. U.S. Marshals watched his truck and arrested him when he returned to it. Now, one news article I read says that the suspect and victim dated for about two months earlier this year before the victim broke off the relationship. But... The article also states that she was 22 months pregnant at the time of the attack. So, my instincts tell me that this information may not be reliable. And, you know you love my channel because of my keen, unmatched instincts in these cases, so I would trust me on this one if I were you. A more reliable article 
says that the suspect has a long history of crimes dating back 30 years and that he has spent several years in prison. Now, I'm not one to judge who someone chooses to date, but I'd just like to share a tip with women out there who are single and dating. It's called Google. It's a search engine on the web that has grown in popularity over the years and can be used to look people up. You know, things like criminal records, prison sentences, and the likelihood that the ex-con you're dating may try to kill you at some point, judging by the severity of his previous crimes, etc. Not that she didn't know all this about him already, but I sure hope she didn't know, because she's about to have his baby and lock herself in with him for a solid 18 years minimum. News reports say that he's a drug addict and he's addicted to crystal meth. God help that poor baby. I hope the victim makes a full recovery and gets herself away from dangerous people like her ex so her baby has a chance at a decent life. Okay, on to our next crime scene, which is another tragedy that took place on the border of the suburbs and the city of Detroit, Eight Mile Road. Yep, Eminem's Eight Mile Road. On September 4th of 2020, a violent crash took place on Eight Mile that killed a two-year-old child and critically injured four others. Detroit police said a Dodge Challenger with three children inside slammed into the side of an SUV and steered off into the side of a building. According to witnesses and surveillance footage, the man driving the Challenger, who is the father of the three children who were inside of it, was racing another car, going eastbound on 8 Mile, doing over 100 miles an hour, with three children in the car. Police say the Challenger in the vehicle it was racing ran a red light, and the Challenger hit the SUV turning onto 8 Mile. The Challenger hit the SUV so hard, the SUV's engine was thrown out onto the road, and then it hit a building so hard that it destroyed the front of the building. The driver was found bleeding on the ground, his two-year-old son was found dead in his car, and his two other children were still in the car in critical condition. I'm surprised they survived at all. The driver of the SUV had to be cut out of her vehicle and was also in critical condition. The driver of the vehicle racing the Challenger was able to swerve to avoid the accident altogether. The two men racing, Michael Lipscomb Jr. and Jeffrey Roberts, were both charged in the two-year-old boy's death, as well as for drag racing. I don't even know what to say about this one. Drag racing has been a long-time problem on 8 Mile Road, but doing it with children in the car? Unreal. That poor baby. Those children must have been so scared. So stupid. Trying to prove how cool he was, and he killed his baby boy. Okay, I need to lighten up the mood for a minute here. I know you all want to make a quick stop to see Eminem's old house while we're here, but we're on a tight schedule and we need to keep going if we want to finish our tour on time, so it'll have to wait till next time. Sorry. Moving on. Next, I have an update for you on a horrific story I covered a week or two ago that started in Detroit and ended in the city of Warren, which is north of Detroit. It was the story about a man found in a burning car in Detroit and his girlfriend and six-year-old son found shot execution style in the basement of her home. When the crime occurred on October 1st, police said they had no suspects. Well, they ended up finding the man who they believe committed the murders. Police say the home where the executions occurred was ransacked. They spent two days processing the home, and during their search they found drugs and large amounts of money. They found evidence that the man found in the burning car in Detroit was dealing drugs with the suspect they were looking for. Police say they reviewed video surveillance footage of a home in Bloomfield Hills where the suspect, 37-year-old Nicholas Barry, lived, and they saw the male victim in the rental car that was burned in the driveway. They watched him leave the home with Barry. They say the rental car was driven around for a while, and then it ended up at a Warren home where the woman and the six-year-old child were executed. Police say the rental car was seen on camera leaving the crime scene, at a high rate of speed. Next, Bari was caught on camera with the rental car 
at a gas station near Detroit, buying a gas can and gas. Police say the last time the male victim was seen alive was at Bari's home. After the murders, police say they found that he took a taxi home and through a data search found that he was searching the internet for expensive watches. Records show that Bari has an extensive criminal record and he was just released from the Michigan Department of Corrections on August 20th of 2020. Police say the three murders were for drugs and money and the FBI is working to declare the, the crimes as federal crimes so the death penalty can be sought in this case. That evil SOB executed a six-year-old child for drugs and money. I hope he fries. Alrighty, on to East Point, where police say that they arrested a 17-year-old boy for shooting and killing his girlfriend while her one-month-old baby laid next to her on September 30th of 2020. According to police, they arrested Raekwon Taylor for the murder of his girlfriend, 17-year-old Kira Seymour, after they responded to a call about a woman who was shot at his home. They say when they arrived on the scene, Kira was already dead. News reports did not say whether Kira's one-month-old baby was Taylor's or not, but according to ClickOnDetroit.com, Kira was visiting Taylor when she was fatally shot in the chest. Kira was a senior at Roseville High School at the time of her death. Taylor was charged with manslaughter, two counts of felony firearm, and death by weapon aimed with intent but without malice, whatever the hell that means. Death by weapon aimed with intent but without malice. So basically he meant to aim the gun at her, but he didn't mean to shoot her, but she ended up dead? I don't know. All I know is that this story is a damned tragedy. She's gone, her baby is without a mother, and he's going to prison, and they're 17. Taylor's being held in Macomb County Jail on a $500,000 bond. Everybody still with me? Just a few more to go. We're heading back to Warren, Michigan now, for a shooting that took place at a Sunoco gas station on October 11th of 2020. Police have determined that the shooting was a murder-suicide. According to the family of 52-year-old Kenya Goodman, Kenya had filed for divorce from her 42-year-old husband, and they were separated. They agreed to meet at a gas station to talk, and were caught on security footage in the parking lot for about 50 minutes before Goodman's husband shot and killed her, and then himself. Reports say she was divorcing him because he hit her, but I guess he decided that if he couldn't hit her, he'd kill her instead. Goodman has two daughters, ages 35 and 14. I hope they get all the love and support they need to help them cope with this tragic, tragic situation. She tried to stand up for herself, respect herself, and teach her daughters how to respect themselves by not tolerating abuse, and she lost her life for it. So sad. Okay, just a hop, skip, and jump down the road from our last crime scene. I have another update to share with you on a story I did a while ago about a senior at Fitzgerald High School who brought a steak knife to school and stabbed a classmate during class over a boy in 2018. The teacher of the class testified in court that Tanea Lewis started chasing Denina Gibson around the classroom, but she thought they were playing because Lewis was laughing. When Lewis caught Gibson, she stabbed her in the back and in her lung. When the teacher realized what was happening, she said she pushed Lewis out into the hallway and tried to help Gibson as Lewis screamed, I want her dead. Gibson was rushed to the hospital and died during surgery. Lewis was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. She told police she killed her for talking to her boyfriend. Lewis's trial was delayed repeatedly, but finally, in September of 2020, Lewis was sentenced to 27 years. First-degree murder in Michigan typically carries a life sentence with no possibility of parole, but because Lewis was 17 at the time of the stabbing, the judge chose a shorter term. Because of Lewis's age, the prosecution claimed that she lacked the brain development to fully recognize the long-term consequences of her actions. 
Students who witnessed the attack said that Lewis was smiling and laughing while she was chasing and stabbing Gibson. Both the victim and suspect were straight-A students who happened to like the same boy, but neither one ended up with him. She killed a girl over a boy in high school. Okay, y'all, we're coming into the home stretch. Just two more to go. Now, these are not all the crimes being committed in the Metro Detroit area. These are just the ones that I chose to share with you. People are going absolutely freaking crazy. Like the next case we're going to visit in Pontiac, Michigan, about 45 minutes north of Detroit. According to police, people waiting in line for the Erebus Haunted House in Pontiac on September 27th of 2020 got a real-life horror show right in the parking lot. Police say a fight broke out in the line to get into the haunted house when 17-year-old Damon Terrell refused to move as the line moved up. Behind him was a 29-year-old man from Detroit, who has not been named, who became angry when Terrell refused to move, so they started arguing. Apparently Terrell wouldn't move because he said the unnamed man from Detroit cut in line in front of him. Not kidding. Guys, not only did I take you to Pontiac, but I took you back to kindergarten too. So, after the argument, the Detroit man's girlfriend said that he was going to the car. As he walked across the parking lot, people still in line watched in horror as Terrell pulled out a gun and started shooting at the Detroit man. Police say the victim was shot in the side, neck, and chest and did not survive his injuries. The suspect fled the scene, but was arrested by police days later. Workers at the haunted house say the tragedy never needed to happen, that all Terrell had to do was let them know that the man cut in line ahead of him, and they would have dealt with it. So, if you come to Michigan, don't cut in line. Ever. Because you may not survive it. Now, on to our last stop of our journey. For this one, we need to travel all the way to Battle Creek where you never, ever want to rent a home if you're the partying type. Police in Battle Creek say that a Michigan landlord clashed with his tenants because they liked to party a lot and he couldn't get any sleep. Apparently, 53-year-old Chad Reed lived below his tenants and they argued a lot about the noise his tenants made. Neighbors say that Reed complained often about his tenants keeping him up late at night. So, when his tenants were reported missing by their families on October 7th of 2020, police considered Reed a person of interest. Apparently, Reed had enough of the noisy couple renting from him, so he shot and killed them. He wrapped their bodies up in tarps and put them in the back of his pickup truck, where they stayed for days. When friends came around looking for the couple, he drove his truck to a nearby abandoned garage and left it there with the bodies in the bed. Police say during the course of the search for the couple, Reed confessed to killing them and hiding their bodies. He claimed that he shot his male tenant because they were arguing and he pulled a knife on him. Then he claimed he shot his female tenant because she tried to run, so he chased her down, shot at her, beat her up, and strangled her to death right in their backyard. So, thinking about moving to Michigan anytime soon? If you are, I will have a house for sale very soon, since I plan on getting the hell out of here. Not that it's safe anywhere nowadays, though, huh? Thank you for joining me on my journey through murder and mayhem in Michigan. I hope you all enjoyed it. Sorry about the tight schedule, but we had a lot to cover. I just realized we never even stopped for a restroom break. You must be dying by now. Okay, okay, we'll make a quick stop on the way home. But please be quick about it so we can beat rush hour traffic. And whatever you do, do not under any circumstances cut in line. <laughs> Stay safe out there, and I'll see you on my next video.